And welcome today to our Wild Sarasota Woodpeckers of Florida webinar series. I am Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. I provide lots of programming to our community, mostly about wildlife, native and invasive plants, and about our Florida ecology. So on the screen are some of the programs that I facilitate out of our office. And my background is that I have a bachelor's of science in environmental studies. I spent a few years doing environmental and outdoor education and then decided to go back to school to become a physician and spent about 12 years in private practice. After that, I transitioned back into environmental education about four and a half years ago into my current position with University of Florida IFAS Extension, Sarasota County. And just until recently, I spent over uh, 20 years or so living in Oscar Shears State Park with my husband who was the park manager and he has transitioned to working with Sarasota County. So we now are living more in town and we have a few less animals because of that, but we had the opportunity to bring up our children and lots of animals at Oscar Shear over the years. And that's a very um, special place to us in our hearts. So next, please. Let me tell you a little bit about the extension office. In case you're not familiar with extension offices, there is one in every single county in our state. And in fact, extension offices are all throughout our country in every state where they are associated with our land grant universities. In Sarasota County, we're a partnership between our county, the University of Florida and the USDA. And our mission is to bring the research done at the university and all of the university's resources to our local communities and address the local needs here in Sarasota County. And we are an educational facility. So we do education in all of our six core program areas that you see on the screen. So we have lots of information available to you on gardening, on sustainability, on landscaping, as well as natural resources, which is the category that we're in, uh, nutrition and healthy living, as well as we manage our 4-H youth development program out of our office as well. Next. And these are just some of the logos that you may be familiar with or some of the programs that we operate that you may have been involved with. On the upper right hand corner is the Florida Master Naturalist Program, which I am a lead instructor for. And we offer multiple classes in that program uh, through our office. It's an amazing program if you're interested in the flora and fauna and ecology of Florida. And of course, also our Master Gardener program, which is the logo right next to it. And I think I saw some Master Gardeners were on the call today as well. Um, they're a great resource and set of volunteers that can provide you with lots of information about gardening here in Florida. Next. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Adelaide Mahler. She is our county intern for the summer this year. And so she has been instrumental in actually putting together many of the programs that you may have um, been involved with in our Wild Sarasota series. And today we're gonna to turn it over to her to actually present our program on woodpeckers. So take it away, Adelaide. Thank you. And I'm so excited to finally take the next step and present to you all today. Um, I'm pursuing an undergraduate degree at Middlebury College in Vermont, and it's a joint between biology and environmental studies. So I'm a conservation biology major, um, and I have a minor in global health. I also play collegiate volleyball, so I'm on our varsity team. We are the Panthers, unfortunately not the Florida Panthers, which wouldn't be appropriate all the way up in Vermont. Um, I'm also interested in food security and do a lot of environmental justice activism, but I am a native Sarasotan, so I'm from the area and I'm really excited to be talking to you all about woodpeckers today. Um, so as a brief overview of our presentation, here's our little outline. We're going to start with all about woodpeckers, what makes a woodpecker a woodpecker, certain adaptations, and a little bit about development, because that's pretty universal across species. Then we're going to dive into Florida-specific species, so the all eight woodpeckers of Florida, and we're going to go into identification so you can spot them yourself, and then a little bit about natural history. And then woodpecker conservation in terms of modern threats and concerns. 
and then how we both attract and deter woodpeckers because we know there's some woodpecker friends and then some woodpecker pests so we're hoping to find you the good ways to manage woodpeckers in your area so in general a woodpecker is a member of the picidae family which is characterized by their unique chisel shaped bill which allows them to excavate easily as you think of the pecking of a woodpecker they also have these specialized tongues which we'll talk a bit more in depth about later um, but it's this hyolingual apparatus that actually wraps around their skull and anchors in their right nostril so it's a pretty cool adaptation that allows them to peck in the way that they do they have strongly curved talons that help them anchor into the tree trunks as well as zygodactyl toes which means two face forward and two face backwards and it kind of makes like an x or a k shape um, hopefully you can see it a little bit in this image on the bottom, but two are four and two are backwards. So it helps act as an anchor. And then as we're so familiar with now, they actually have nostrils that are covered by these stiff bristly feathers and it acts as a mask to keep out the sawdust. So just like we wear masks for COVID prevention, woodpeckers wear masks to keep out the sawdust. Woodpeckers are omnivorous and cavity nesters, so they inhabit cavities and that's where they'll raise their young and roost at night. And they have this distinctive swooping flight, which is a good way to identify um, woodpeckers in the air. And then what good do woodpeckers do? They're predators, so they're important for ecosystem balance. As omnivores, they a lot of them are even borderline like insectivores, eating a lot of ants and other bugs. Um, so that's important. And then they're also an indicator of environmental health, much like eagles and other predatory birds. Um, as pollutants biomagnify up the food chain, food chain, you can see how that impacts different bird species. So if woodpeckers decline, that might be a sign that there's problems with pollutants in the area. So the first adaptation that we're going to get into is their tail feathers. So they have these stiff bracing tail feathers that act kind of as a prop or a kickstand when they're on their trees. So woodpeckers move hold on vertically rather than sitting like more horizontally on limbs and branches of trees. Um, and they're slightly curved at the end kind of as that little prop. And then Dr. Jerry Jackson, I was watching a webinar, he presented on woodpeckers. He's a woodpecker specialist. He even referenced that the fact that all woodpeckers have black tail feathers and the actual black pigment adds strength. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the flight. So I did this little diagram to kind of illustrate the fact that woodpeckers have this undulating flight. So they kind of go through the air like that. So they'll be flapping at the low points of th these waves. And then at the crest, they actually pull in their wings to kind of break through the air more and propel them forward. But then that does mean that they dive and then have to keep flapping again. Um, and this is comparing to some soaring flight patterns and then like a flap flap glide with their wings out of other types of birds. So here's my favorite part of woodpeckers and I wasn't quite aware of it. I knew they had their tongues and that was kind of a distinct part of woodpeckers, but their hyolingual apparatus Hyo referring to the hyoid boin, and we actually have a hyoid boin ourselves, boin, bone. I'm a little nervous, so excuse my tripping on my language. Um, and lingual meaning tongue. So as I said before, it wraps from the tip of the tongue around, kind of forks off into two, and then comes back into one and anchors in the right nostril. And this directs the movement of the tongue, but also stabilizes the neck and head as they're pecking. So just another way for them to keep their brain secure and prevent against concussions. Um, and then the paraglossal is actually the tip of the tongue. It's like what we would think of as being a tongue. Um, and it used to be believed that that was more of a spearing motion, that it would like puncture grubs and other things, but it actually acts more like a rake and is barbed or brush tipped. And that's kind of how they extract um, things out of these cavities that they excavate. So hopefully we're going to watch a video on the hyolingual apparatus so you can see it in action. Uh, woodpeckers are famous for having these really long tongues that they use for probing for grubs in holes in trees that they've pounded. 
Um, what's really cool about these guys, if I can grab this guy's tongue, is that their tongue actually wraps around the back of their head and all the way onto the top of their head, sometimes as far as reaching back into the right nostril. That's a side view. Let me see if I can reproduce this in the top view. Let me grab his tongue here. Sorry, trying to grab it. Got it. Um, and so here it is in top view. And you can actually see it's really uh, pretty remarkable. There's another really cool video um, on, on the internet uh, that shows this really well as well, but I wanted to see it. Yeah, so that was you being able to see this unique adaptation in action. And like I made reference to earlier, this actually plays into their ability to peck. So when a woodpecker pecks on a surface, and sometimes that'll be a tree because they're excavating or making a cavity for themselves to nest in, or sometimes they're drumming, so they'll find specific resonant surfaces to pound on. So that could be like your tin roof or something to that effect. And that's a form of communication. But they're doing this pecking and they can peck at up to a force of a thousand Gs, which is 10 times as much as two NFL players colliding. So that's sustaining a serious amount of force. And they're doing that at 20 times per second or up to 12,000 times per day. So kind of the question is how do they sustain Sustain this force. Well, like I said, they have that hyolingual apparatus that helps kind of anchor their head, but they also have a super strong skull with thick plates that are actually porous. And that porous material allows it to absorb the shock more easily. They also have a cartilage barrier kind of on the back of their neck that helps with keeping their skull in place and diffusing any energy. And they have very little cerebrospinal fluid, so they're the their brain itself is pretty small within their head cavity, but there's not a lot of liquid moving around. So there's not a big ability for it to rattle and cause um, kind of any sort of damage. They also have an extra eyelid that goes over it and it thickens as they're pecking. So this is less about sustaining the force, but the pressure that builds up in their head and this extra eyelid that helps keep their eyes within their head. Otherwise they could burst out because of the pressure. And then lastly, the lower portion of their beak, the beak is like a bone structure coated in this other material. Um, and the lower portion is longer so that the energy that comes in is diverted more into their body, their chest, rather than up into their head. So diverting that energy and making sure as little goes to the head as possible. So they're not flying around perpetually concussed. Um, in terms of maturation and sexual differentiation, these are two baby red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, so woodpeckers are monogamous and they all have these pretty characteristic shiny white eggs. Broods typically include three to six fledglings, although that varies species to species. And the male makes the roosting cavity and that becomes the nest. So males are actually commonly the primary um, caregiver because the mother bird will go back to her roost at night versus the males in charge of overnight duty and tending to um, the baby birds. But eventually they will split the brood and then they'll mature and at about one year of age is when they reach sexual maturity. Newborn woodpeckers are sightless and featherless. Um, and I thought this was really cool. It's also something I learned from Dr. Jerry Jackson, but the stimulus that elicits the begging response of chicks from um, their parents is that the parents, as they land in the cavity, they block out the sunlight and then the chicks open up their mouths and it creates this diamond pattern with the oral phalanges, the two um, beak tips, and then the tongue. So it's almost a target and that kind of glows in the dark. It has this fluorescence and that's how um, the parent woodpecker knows where to deposit the new food. And mature adults, you can actually sex most all but the red-headed woodpeckers based on their coloring. Um, so usually it's males have more red or kind of any red. And then in one instance, it's about a black or red mustache depending on geographic location. But that's kind of the general background on woodpeckers. And now we're getting into the woodpeckers of Florida. So there are eight species of woodpeckers here in Florida, um, extant species. There's talk about the ivory-billed woodpecker, but um, 
I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that the ivory build's extinct, unfortunately, um, although it's much harder to say when something isn't alive than when it is alive, so who knows? Um, but they're divided into two genes, so the woodpecker family is divided into two genuses here in Florida. We have the Melanerpini genus, which is the downy woodpecker, the closely related hairy woodpecker, red cockaded woodpecker, red bellied woodpecker, and red headed woodpecker. There's also the Pekini woodpeckers, which are our yellow bellied sapsucker, our northern flicker, and our pileated woodpecker. So the pileated woodpeckers are your classic kind of um, like Woody the woodpecker. Look, so they're the largest woodpecker of North America at 16 to 19 inches tall. Um, and they have these white stripes that go kind of down their face and the triangular red crest, which is typically the biggest giveaway. Um, they also have white underwings that are visible during flight. So if you do see one in the air, that's a good way to identify it. And then in terms of sexing, um, woodpeckers, they have this red mustache and hopefully, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but I'm trying to highlight that right there along its lower beak. There's that strip of red. So that's a male woodpecker. Um, they're forest birds and they just drill distinctive rectangular holes into dead wood that are up to a foot long. And they have particularly long necks, like proportional to their body. Um, so they leverage those necks in this digging. And then they consume ants and larvae up to 40, between 40 and 97% of their diet is ants. And a different study referenced up to 60% being carpenter ants. So a quick quiz, if you can pop in the chat, which the left or the right is a male pileated woodpecker? Oh, good. Everyone's picking up. It's both. Yeah, I was trying to trick you there. I honestly couldn't find a picture that would have one or the other necessarily. They were all males that I could find for in public domain. Um, but these are both male pileated woodpeckers because of their red mustache. Thanks for paying attention. Um, next up. Oh, it's not letting me advance. Okay. We have the yellow-bellied sapsucker. So they're small, medium to small woodpeckers at seven to nine inches in height um, with stout straight bills and white pattern faces with this red forehead. And they have, it's kind of hard to see here, but like a longer white stripe on the folded wing and a black chest shield that kind of goes over their white to yellowish underbelly. And then males have red throats. So that's the way to sex them. Their primary source, as per their name, is sap, but that's also supplemented by insects, spiders, and fruits. And they use a different tree for nesting and feeding, and the feeding trees are usually decaying with this red heart fungus um, because that allows them to access the sap a little bit more easily. They reuse their nests from year to year, and they're the sole, like, truly migratory woodpecker species in eastern North America. So they breed in Canada and then migrate as far south as Panama. And I thought this was interesting and couldn't find any conclusive reason as to why it was, but females tend to migrate farther south than the males do. Um, so just a little fun fact for you all. And then in terms of sap sucking, they bore these holes known as sap wells horizontally. So early on in the season, they have to have these deeper round holes and that's for actually getting into the xylem, getting the sap in the xylem. And then they'll start to maintain later in the season, like as the uh, leaves start to form on the tree, these shallow rectangular holes. So they'll continue to break away. And that's getting at the phloem. And they'll also um, eat the cambium of the tree, so the actual cellular tissue of the tree. Um, they have a preference for birch and maples. Um, just because they have more free flowing sap. And then sick and wounded trees are especially rich for sap extraction. They have this specialized brush tip as I was talking with a paraglossal. So it laps up the sap, but it also acts as an insect trap. So insects will get trapped in these sap wells and that's great for them because it's extra nutrients, extra protein. Um, and they also end up attracting hummingbirds, bats, porcupines, a whole slew of other animals. So they're creating habitat by making these wells. 
Then we have the northern flicker. So they're a fairly large woodpecker at 11 to 12 inches in height. They have this slightly down curved, you can kind of see it there, beak um, and a brownish gray overall um, coloring with these black striping on the back. Um, and they have spots on their breast um, that is also used to identify them. The yellow, their tail feathers as extended, and you can kind of see in the last picture, have these yellow undersides. So that's why they're the yellow shafted northern flicker. There's also the red shafted flicker. Um, and the males have a mustache. So here you can see the black mustache, which is typical in the east, and then out in the west, they have a red mustache. And that was the other exception I was talking about in terms of sexing um, woodpeckers. So another cool thing about the flicker is they're a ground feeding woodpecker. So they forage for ants by hammering into the soil and they'll also eat other insects, nuts, seeds, fruits, etc. And they're often found perched upright on branches. So rather than on the trunks of trees, they'll actually be found on the branches and dive down and catch stuff in that way. Um, and they're occasionally found nesting in their like earthen burrows rather than cavities up in trees. And they have a distinct flicker call. So it kind of sounds like their name flicker. It goes flicka flicka. But I also don't think it always sounds like that. So maybe you should check around different recordings if you do want to identify um, flickers by their sounds. Um, and then the yellow and the red shafted flickers are known to hybridize. Then we have the most common species here in Sarasota, the red-bellied woodpecker. And I know some people get confused because you can hardly make out the red belly along the bottom, but they do have a very prominent red head. They're a small, sleek woodpecker at, at about nine inches tall. And they have this black and white barring along the back and the red napes, while the males also have a red crown. So it extends further up onto their head. And then they're known for their reddish yellow underbelly that I just mentioned. Um, they're opportunists feeding on a whole slew of things from fish, frogs, insects, nuts, fruits. And they're actually known to create larders of nuts. So they'll store them away from later, for later, which is pretty unique. Um, and they're more likely to pick at the bark than drill, so they're kind of peeling back layers to get at the insects underneath rather than drilling in. Um, and males and females have different tongue shapes to forage at different heights. So the males tend to nest, uh, not nest, scavenge higher up in the trees and the females down lower, and they're kind of specially adapted for those different uses. Um, and then they do compete with red-headed woodpeckers and starlings. And in both instances, they're outcompeted. But fortunately, they're still prevalent enough. And I see them all the time in my neighborhood. So you can look out for them. So we have another quiz. Is this a male or female red-bellied woodpecker? Yeah, so there's isn't the red crown. So this is a female because remember in general males have more red and the head is not fully red in this instance. And now we're getting into the red-headed woodpecker. So although the red-bellied woodpecker has a red head, the red-headed woodpecker truly is magnificently red in the head. Um, they're a medium-sized woodpecker with shorter tail feathers. They're known as a flying checkerboard. So they're black, white, and red with a red head, the white underbelly, and then half white, half black wings. And juveniles do have a brown head before maturing. So if you see a primarily black and white woodpecker with a brown head flying around, it may be a juvenile red-headed woodpecker. They're fly catchers. So of the species in Florida, they're the only fly catching woodpecker. So they feed on insects, acorns, beech nuts, fruits, etc. And then they also cache foods like the red-bellied woodpecker um, and they'll cover it up with their bark. So they'll like hollow excavate out an area and then fill it back in. And compared to other woodpeckers with their undulating flight, their flight is a little bit more level. I'm not really sure what to attribute that to. They also have a wider bill for fly catching, so they're adapted for 
um, their needs in terms of hunting, but they're not able to excavate their own nests in the same way as other woodpeckers. Prospective males kind of play hide and seek, so it's a little fun fact about redheaded woodpecker behavior. And unfortunately, they've had a population decline of 70% since 1966. So they used to be a pretty common woodpecker. And I think there was one anecdote because there used to be a bounty out for um, redheaded woodpeckers because they were so abundant. But that one man was able to shoot a hundred um, redheaded woodpeckers in a single cherry tree. But since then, populations have really declined and I'm just going to make sure I do this correctly. Yes, they're on the bird's watch list, so they're not quite endangered, but um, they're getting there. Then we have the downy woodpecker. So this is the smallest of Florida woodpeckers and the second like most likely that you will see in Sarasota. So we first have the red-bellied woodpecker and then the downy woodpecker and then maybe the pileated woodpecker. Um, they're black and white checkered wings with a white stripe down the back, which you can't really see in any of these pictures, unfortunately, but there will be one coming up to show it more easily. They have white underbellies and distinctive black facial markings. Um, and then the males have this little piece of red on the back of their heads. Um, males also perch on thinner branches and females choose the thicker ones, and that's actually because of the pelvic structure um, of the birds. So the females are, like their pelvis is oriented in a way that they need the thicker branches for how their feet can grasp. Um, they're frequently members of mixed species flocks. So as they migrate north, they'll blend in with other species and that's just great for protecting against predators, but they are kind of sole in um, this characteristic. They're found in woodlands and suburban areas and will move readily into suburban areas and are attracted by bird feeders. Um, and they mainly eat insects um, along with nuts, seeds, and fruit. And like I said, they're the most abundant in this area. And then hairy woodpeckers, if you're not seeing a big difference in the images from the previous slide and this slide, that's because it is kind of hard to tell the difference. Um, hairy woodpeckers are a bit larger. They're more medium size at seven to 10 inches long versus about a six inch downy woodpecker. They have the black and white checkered wings, the white strip down the back and the white underbelly and the same red patch for males. Um, in terms of diet and behavior, they're found in mature woodlands and suburbs and 75% of their diet is insects with a particular fondness for larvae. Um, and they'll often mooch off pileated woodpeckers and sap suckers. And they'll follow them around and see what um, woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers may have left behind as they're peeling away the bark or what sap can be gleaned off of sap suckers. And they have the greatest distribution across North America. So yes, the left is a downy and the biggest way you can tell is the length of the beak. So hairy woodpeckers have some pretty prominent beaks versus the downy woodpecker only makes up maybe a third of their head. So you can kind of look at that proportionally. The other difference is, um, or big identification difference is their height. So the downy is about six inches tall versus the hairy is between seven, like around 50% bigger or taller. So that can be a way for you to identify. Okay. Um, my next slide is taking a second to load. Here we have the red cockaded woodpecker, which is an endangered species of woodpecker. Um, in terms of identification, it's a small to medium sized woodpecker at eight to nine inches tall, but pretty slim. They have a black and white barred back with the flashy cheek pattern um, in this malar band. And then males have a red cockade. So this goes back to revolutionary times when um, Washington actually 
the bows that they would put on their hats were called cockades and red cockades red cockaded woodpeckers have a little lip of just one or two red feathers kind of coming out of their eye up by this black patch at the top of their head and unfortunately this is a female wood, uh, red cockaded woodpecker and I couldn't find um, an image we could use of a male one but it would be located right there and that's how they get their name. Um, they eat adults, um, bugs, larvae, and eggs um, and they favor foraging in large pines compared to smaller ones. They're cooperative breeders um, with one breeding pair and several helpers that tend to be the males, and they excavate numerous uh, cavities within the territory, and the breeding male roosts in the one that they actually use as the nest and is the best one, the best of their cavities, and these cavities may be reused for up to decades with distinctive sap runs, which you can see around here, but they'll drill into the tree surrounding it to deter climbing snakes um, from entering in. So again, they're habitat specialists, and this is why they are and have been listed as endangered since 1970. Um, they need old growth, open understory pines, especially in the Southeast, and they particularly like longleaf pines. Um, they can also deal with scattered slash pines mixed with bald cypress, and they roost exclusively in live pines. So they, as I said before, they'll excavate these cavities and then puncture holes all around them to create these sap runs um, that will deter snakes from climbing in and eating their young out of their nests. And they do require a good amount of territory, so that may exceed 200 acres. Um, in terms of population, they've had a cumulative decline of 86% since 1966, um, and they're really vulnerable to clear cutting and forest fragmentation because they need these live pines and they need good swaths of territory, con like contiguous territory. And the estimated current breeding population is 15,000 individuals. So kind of what do we do about this? In terms of modern conservation, we have two species of concern. That's the red cockaded, which is endangered, and then the red headed, which is being watched right now and kind of on the edge as to um, its status. In terms of modern efforts, there's a lot of efforts to preserve forested lands, particularly these live pines, and some reforestation efforts in hopes of rebuilding habitat. Um, they're also making artificial cavities and a surprising amount of um, woodpeckers perish due to car collisions. So that's another thing to watch out for on the road. But returning to artificial cavities, um, the Louisiana Fish and Wildlife Department actually works a lot with artificial nest cavities. So, so that was a little bit of background on how they actually install these artificial nest cavities. Again, it was um, a video from Louisiana, but there are some efforts to do the same here in Florida. And it's a really intensive project because you have to get up in the tree, you have to out this hole, you have to insert the insert and then fill it in and then again being mindful that you need these sap and resin runs, so trying to emulate that as well. So you're really trying to make um, a fortified cavity for these red cockaded woodpeckers that are endangered. So how might one attract a woodpecker should they want one? And then we'll get into how you could deter woodpeckers if you're finding some, I don't know, woodpecking neighbors that you wouldn't care to have around your house. So in terms of woodpecker habitat, leave dead trees, also known as snags. Um, that's a great place for woodpeckers to make cavities and make nests and make homes. Um, also, palms are really great, especially for red-bellied woodpeckers. Dead and decaying palms are perfect. They're like a, a softer material for them to excavate. 
You can also attract woodpeckers with bird feeders, so you can leave out fruit, particularly citrus and oranges are known to attract woodpeckers pretty easily. Seeds, suet, I'm gonna put a little, I should have put an asterisk, but I'm putting a verbal one. Um, just be careful with that. And then mealworms, um, and you're most likely to attract red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, these right here are um, hairy woodpeckers, but here in Florida, red-bellied would be the ones that would probably come followed by downy woodpeckers, which can also be um, attracted to bird feeders. So then what do you do if you don't want a woodpecker in your area? Well, it's kind of important to question why they have come. So they're there, they're drumming on your home, and that's to establish territory and attract mates. Or insects have infested your house's siding, so they're trying to get an easy meal by drumming along your siding and opening up some holes um, to get at whatever has come and infested your house. And then lastly, they're looking for an actual nest cavity and want to excavate in that way. Um, so in terms of options, one thing I read a lot about was covering your siding with lightweight nylon mesh or like some plastic netting. And if you hang that from the eaves about um, three inches from the siding, that can help deter woodpeckers and hopefully they'll move out of your area. You can also just straight up put plastic sheets over your siding, like directly on it, and that can create enough of a barrier to deter a woodpecker. Um, you can use noise and or visuals to deter them. So I'm not sure how um, like predatory birds like owls might not be the best distraction, but if you make loud noises that can get them away or just kind of flashing brighter lights or other distractions um, to respect them, but to scare them and tell them you're here. And then last is kind of a joke, but if you're dealing with woodpeckers and don't have um, any other options, I guess earplugs are something you can do to kind of drown out the drumming. So as an overview, we have the yellow-bellied sapsucker, the northern yellow-shafted flicker, and here you can really see the yellow shafts on the wings. We have the red cockaded woodpecker with the resin sap runs um, and what would be a red cockade up here, but you can kind of see how similar they are to the downy and the hairy. We have the pileated woodpecker, which is the largest woodpecker in North America. Your woody the woodpecker with the red crest and the red mustache on males. You have the red-bellied woodpecker, so that's what you'll see most commonly here in Sarasota and kind of throughout this area of Florida um, with a red belly that isn't visible in this picture, but the red head with more red on the crown of the head for the males, and then the black and white barred back. We have the red-headed woodpecker, which is the checkerboard woodpecker, with the fully red head, um, black and white wings, and then a white underbelly the hairy woodpecker, and then the downy woodpecker, which again, very similar in appearance. Hey, Heather Moore, I don't know how you would know this unless you had a good memory, but it actually is C, the 1995 discovery. Um, so the space shuttle actually had 208 different cavities excavated into the like shell of the shuttle. Um, and it was believed to be done by flickers, northern flickers that were populating the area because there was a nest found 1.3 miles from the launching pad. But then some ornithologists brought up the fact if they had a nest, they wouldn't be excavating. So those probably aren't the woodpeckers of concern. It's another woodpecker that's trying to build a nest. So I'm not sure they ever found the culprit, but it's kind of a cute, funny little anecdote that also pertains to Florida because we're all about space down here and space travel. And that kind of concludes what I have for you on Florida Woodpeckers. Thank you, Adelaide. That was such a great job. Um, actually, I learned a lot from Adelaide as she was doing the research for this presentation. 